Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel where I have a video about audio. More specifically, input coupling capacitors. What value, what type should you select for your amplifier project? Now I don't want to confuse anybody. These little boards that you buy, they're pre-assembled. You can buy them on eBay, buy them anywhere. These already have capacitors built into them. You don't have to worry about those. This video is more geared towards the person who is building an amplifier or building a kit and selecting their own components. Why do you need an input coupling capacitor anyway? Well, the main reason is because you want to block DC from getting into the amplifier and that can cause all sorts of havoc not the least including DC on the output terminals, which you really don't want. And as a amplifier designer, for example, he doesn't know how the amplifier is going to be used. What's going to be connected to it? Some input sources could actually have a little DC offset on it. And like I say, it could be an issue. So it's much better just to include a blocking capacitor or a coupling capacitor, if you will, to keep the DC out of your amplifier. Now when we connect a capacitor in series with the input, we create what's known as a high pass filter. And I drew a little graph here with the frequency on the x-axis and the signal amplitude on the y-axis. So we start here in the pass band. The signal is at 100%. And as the signal decreases, again with that capacitor in series with the input, it'll start to roll off and it'll form a curve like this. Now at 70.7% is the pole frequency. And that's what we calculate. Why is it that value? Well, it has to do with mathematics. You know, there's pi used in the equation, and that is a, you know, a mathematical value that you see often. So where do we set this pole frequency? Well, the audio spectrum is considered to be 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Would 20 hertz be a good place to set this? Well, not really, because you see, that signal is already rolling off in the passband area and any amplifier designer doesn't want their amplifier showing the signal rolling off in the audio spectrum because that would be just awful. You know, speakers and our hearing, they roll off, but God forbid the amplifier roll off. So, you know, we don't want that there. We want to set this pole frequency down more where this curve doesn't intervene with our uh, frequency response of the amplifier. So how do you figure the value of this capacitor? Well, you need to know a couple things. You need to know the frequency or the this pole frequency like we talked about. And we need to know the input impedance of the amplifier. Now, the input impedance of an amplifier could be a long, drawn-out, complicated subject. But the way most amplifiers are designed, it's usually a value of a resistor that's across the input like this. And these two devices form a high-pass filter network. Now you might say, doesn't some current pass into the amplifier and represent additional impedance? Well, yes, but the value of this resistor is going to dominate the resistance. It's usually much higher. So just use the value of this resistor when you do your calculations. Now with uh, integrated circuit type amplifiers, that resistor can be external or internal to the IC. If it's internal, there should be a input impedance given on the data sheet. But with this LM1875 circuit example I have here, it's external, and they're using a 22K, 22 kilo ohm resistor in that case. So using that as an example, we could 
use that in our calculation here. So here I have a capacitive reactance equation. Well, it's kind of modified. You know, it's very easy to swap these variables around. You know, if you want to put frequency out here, you can just move F up here and bring C down here. It's very easy to swap your variables, like I say. Now an audio amp designer, engineer type person might want to set the pull frequency down to like uh, below 5 hertz probably. I would say setting it just below 10 is plenty good enough. Just use a frequency of 10 hertz in this case. So we'll put 2 times pi times 10, the frequency, times 22k, that's our resistance value of this little board amp here, and enter. Now I have to take the inverse of that because it's 1 over. So here's what we get. Let's hit the engineering button so it puts it in a notation we can see better. So 723 nanofarads, and you're going, what? Where am I going to get that value? Well, go up, round up to the next nearest value. One microfarad is good enough for me for the amplifier. Now, just so you know, they used a 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitor on this board, which would set the pole frequency down to 0.7 hertz. It's extremely low. A little overdone in my opinion, but you know, it's fine. It'll work. Now what capacitor type would you select? You, know, you have all kinds of different types of capacitors. Which one is the best? Well, you have to consider size, cost, and things like that as well as how good the capacitor will perform. Now there's a lot of BS out there about capacitors and added distortion. Now it is quite true that some types of capacitors do have a nonlinear response to voltage changes across their plates. You know, electrolytic capacitors are guilty of that. Ceramic capacitors have that plus other issues. I'm not going to get into all those issues with ceramics. We'll just push those out of the way and say do not use those in the audio path. They have several issues and reasons why you really don't want to use ceramics in the audio path. On the other hand, they're great for uh, supply bypass use, uh, compensation type capacitors, you know the NPO type, uh, highly uh, accurate type should be used for compensation capacitors, but as far as just your normal signal caps, uh, don't use them. Film caps are the ideal type to use. There's different types of film capacitors out there that are available. But in my opinion, polyester type capacitor, also known as mylar, those are plenty good to use. Polypropylene types, they're good for using in crossover networks and speakers and things. I don't think it's necessary to use them in the amplifier. They're, you know, they take up a lot of room. They're going to cost money. And what I talk about here momentarily, you're going to see that it's kind of pointless to use them anyway. What about electrolytics? Well, I would go film if I could, but you could use an electrolytic. You know, it's adding another electrolytic is another failure point. But as far as adding distortion, it's going to be a non-issue, and let me tell you why. Electrolytic capacitors and other types of capacitors that have nonlinear response to voltage range across their plates, just like I mentioned, it's only going to be an issue when there is a big range of voltage across the plates. But in the pass band, the capacitor acts like a short. There's not going to be a big change in voltage across their plates. Thus, there's not going to be much distortion at all. Very, very small. 
In fact, there's been studies on this by real engineers, not audio fools, who have shown that the distortion from electrolytic capacitor in the circuit is going to be very, very small. In fact, the rest of the circuit will contribute more distortion than the capacitor will. Because we set that pole frequency so low, you know, well below 20 hertz, that distortion, again, is non-issue. Don't worry about it. But my opinion is, you know, if you can get a film cap that'll fit, electrolytic capacitors tend to be less reliable. And in this circuit, besides these two supply bypass caps, there's really only one other electrolytic in here, and that's this one here. I mean, if this one was a film, this one in the uh, negative feedback circuit is the only one there. So keeping the uh, amount of lytics in your circuit minimal is ideal. Another point that some people bring to the table is the phase shift as you're going through the pole frequency. There's a kind of an audio fool type thing says that, oh, it causes a smearing of the bass response. And this is pretty, pretty much shown not to be an issue with the sound itself. I mean, the phase shift is there, but it's inaudible. Again, we set the pole frequency down so low that the phase shift is going to be small in the pass band region. And it's not audible. It's nothing to worry about. I'm on this Okawa Electric Design website. I'll put a link in the description because it has a lot of useful tools. I'm on the CR filter, capacitor resistor type filter, high pass. We decided to go with the next highest value of one microfarads. It's going to be used in conjunction with the 22K resistor for a filter. You can use the capacitive reactance equation by substituting to find the capacitance, the one I showed earlier. And you know, I'm just calculating in here, it comes out to 7.23. That's the cutoff frequency, or what I was calling the pole frequency. And you can see the pole frequency is the same. Here's the graph. It does look a little different because the graph is logarithmic. And you can see here, this here, this line is the 10 hertz, this is the 20. And you can see it's just barely starting to roll off. You know, maybe 1 dB or something. It's just, to me, it's nothing to worry about. An engineer would probably use a 2.2 a microfarad cap so that would uh, reduce that even more. Now here is the phase and you know at the pole frequency it's going to be 45 degrees. At 20 Hertz it's 20 degrees and you're not really going to hear it at the pole frequency even if your ears could hear that low so 20 degrees is a non-issue. It's not going to hurt the sound at all. So don't listen to the audio fool stuff. Well, to put it kind of in an academic term, this was the lecture part of the video. Now we'll move to the lab part of the video. I'll pop in a one microfarad cap and we'll look at the frequency roll off on the scope. I wanted to use this function generator but it's pretty crappy and the amplitude actually grows at lower frequencies so it would kind of skew the test so I took audacity and made some waveforms at that 7.23 Hertz 20 Hertz and 100 Hertz so we can compare that change of plans here I forgot about this cap being in the feedback loop which will skew the numbers a little bit though its frequency should be tuned pretty low as well. So I'm going to move to the breadboard where I can take the cap out and just bypass it. And 
we'll get the measurements here. Let me set up. Another good reason, I don't have to sit there and hold that wire on that connector because I'm bypassing that input cap that it had. Okay, so I have the other amplifier. I have the one microfarad cap on the input. And we'll start at 100 hertz here. And let's see. Well, I want to get more waveforms on the screen. I think it gives you a more accurate measurement. So we're getting 2.45 volts RMS. So let me move forward. This is at 20 hertz. You can see it did drop a little bit, but it's you know it's just not enough to worry about. Now I'll drop down to the pole frequency that we selected here. Get some waveforms on the screen. Okay. So I'll take 1.66 and divide that by the 2.45 we measured earlier. So we're getting about 0.68. So that's a little bit off from the uh, 0.707 we should be getting. But you know, uh, the capacitor might be slightly off and for other reasons. The music player doesn't seem to roll off. I check that because that would affect it a bit. And we're getting pretty close, so you can see how that capacitor is rolling off. Well, I hope that was of some interest or at least some use to you. That's it. Thanks for watching.